Welcome to this episode of the Jim Informer Podcast. I'm Chris Gilbert, your host for this episode. And today our guest is Steve Olson, the owner of two archetype strength gyms in Raleigh, North Carolina. I got a chance to work out at both of these gyms recently. They were both really cool, and I'm excited to talk to Steve about them. But before we get started, let's pause and I'll show you the photos I took while I was at these gyms. All right, Steve, you've got two gyms, um, both similar. I would call them kind of powerlifting gyms, um, strength gyms. Um, we categorize everything in the strength area as more of a powerlifting gym. Yeah. Uh, but like, how did you like, what was your, what was the the process of you, if you don't mind telling the, the audience, like, what was the process of you saying, okay, like, I want to be, I want to own a gym. Um. So I, it starts all the way back in undergrad. I got a bachelor's in exercise science. I did an internship, you know, with a collegiate strength conditioning football team. Um, and then I got my master's in exercise science and I continued to work in collegiate strength conditioning. And then I went to the private side of things and continued to train athletes. So gyms have been the entirety of my professional career. Um, starting at 20 years old, all to all the way till now going on 40. So I've spent far too long in gyms and one day I decided that I'm tired of working for other people. So I want to do it my way. That's cool. Yeah. And, and your gym's a bit, a bit different than some other gyms that I've been to. I love the way that you described it to me um, before I came down. Um, when you said um, I put together a gym for guys who don't take themselves too seriously and like to lift heavy stuff and drink a lot of beer. Yep. Exactly. Like I thought that yeah, was a, it's a perfect descriptive. We have people that compete. We have power lifters. We have strong men, um, not really bodybuilders, as I'm sure you could tell based on the style of gym. Um, but it's largely people that just like to work hard and play hard. And yeah, it was not, yeah, not too much of the influencer vibe. Like we don't really cater to that crowd too much. It's really just people that want to lift weights in a not too busy of an environment with top quality stuff, but enjoy the process of it. Not yeah, it, was, it, it were definitely like no nonsense. Like if we want to get into the atmosphere a little bit, they were definitely no nonsense sort of gyms. Um, hold on one second. Um, can you give me like twenty minutes? Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna edit that out. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, I'm at work because I have to go get my son. So um, I just I'm doing it at work. That's why I have this back. Yeah, no problem. Right. I'm going to back up. Where was I? There's no nonsense. All right. So your gyms are um, no nonsense sort of gyms. We want to talk about the atmosphere. Um, they're definitely not, not like, not that they're not nice gyms, but they're, they're not frilly gyms. They're definitely like come in here and work hard. And like, this is where, where you do that. Like I'm mm -hmm. guessing that was something that you wanted to create on purpose. Yeah, we say uh, that second part is a big motto of mine. Get your workout in and go home. Like, it's, I, I don't want, we have a really strong community, um, but a big part of us is like, you know, get your workout in and go home. Like, this isn't your life. This shouldn't be a life consuming thing. It's just a really cool spot to get your thing in and go home. Uh, the other thing that we say repeatedly is we have everything you need. And by that, I mean, we don't have rows of treadmills and Stairmasters and, um, assault everything. And I mean, you saw it, we have all the specialty bars, the racks, the weights, we have the dumbbells, we have the benches, we have the, the most needed nine or so machines, um, and then open space. And that's really it. And we, uh, once we got the things that you need in place, we decided to build the environment around that. How can we make this the best workout you've ever had. And that's one thing we say repeatedly. We, you know, we even had a thing called the best workout guarantee is if uh, people joined and it wasn't the best workout they ever had, we would cancel their membership and refund them. And we oh, did wow. this because yeah, we just, cause no one ever had to take us up on it. 
when you have the equipment you need in a great environment and inviting people, I mean, I think you're, you're on the right track to uh, oh, a really cool gym. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. We always say like that equipment will get someone in the gym, but atmosphere keeps them there. Yeah, for sure. And I, I liked the atmosphere. It was different than, than quite a few of the other gyms that I went to while I was on my North Carolina trip. Hmm. Um, and it was, but it was definitely no nonsense. And I kind of appreciated that after being you know, <laughs> influencer gyms that I was on my trip. Not that I didn't enjoy the influencer gyms, but it was definitely a different take. Yeah. No tripods, no live streamed workouts. No, we just, it, it, and I would, it's not that we ban that. It's not that we don't allow it. It's just the culture that we've set. They just don't come to us. Yeah. Um, we have loud music on 24 seven, you know, that's part of the environment we set. People aren't allowed to turn the music off. They're not allowed to turn it down. Nice. Um, it stays on and it stays loud 24 seven. And we do that purposely because, uh, what we talk about all the time is the most important person to come to the gym is not you, but the person after you. And so that's why we've set this culture in place in these rules. You have to clean, you have to put your stuff back. You leave the music on. Um, you don't hog the equipment. We don't leave stuff out. Like it's, it's really trying to cater to the next person that comes into the gym. And if you're live streaming workouts and leaving your weights out and not cleaning anything up, you're just leaving the place in next a, a mess for the next person to come in. Um, so we just cater to a very specific type of person that appreciates that. No, that's awesome. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. I work out in the morning. I love the music loud. I get I don't I don't like to have headphones in. And I don't yeah, same. like being approachable. So I don't wear like headphones over my ears. So I feel like that makes me unapproachable. I like to talk to people when I'm at the gym because you know, not that I spend all day there, but you know, I, I don't I don't mind talking to somebody in between my sets and but I like the music to be loud. So I, yeah. I love part of it. It definitely sets the tone. So that was it, cool. And that's huge, right? The environment, we talk about environment all the time is everything for us. Mm -hmm. And we've had people like, hey, there's no one here. Can I turn the music down? And it's no, like, absolutely not. <laughs> I love just, that. Just, just because you want the music down doesn't mean the person coming in three minutes from, from now wants it down, right? So we have our standards and that people, they can like it or they can not like it, but they can also choose not to come back. And that's, yeah, that's, awesome. that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Now the equipment you have, you mentioned like we have what you need. Yes. Um, now, obviously, like your powerlifting side of things, like the equipment was top notch. Um, on your accessory equipment, mm -hmm. everything was, is it Fettle? Yeah, Fettle from uh, Atlanta. Yep. Yeah, that was a brand I hadn't come across before. Like, what was your thought process in choosing that brand? Because that was pretty much what you had across both gyms, right? Mm -hmm. We try to standardize everything. So a, a big philosophy for us is like, it doesn't matter which one you go to, you can get your workout in. And you, you know better than anyone, like if every place you're going has different stuff, it's hard to follow a program. Mm -hmm. um, a, at least strictly follow a program, you'd be kind of messing around a little bit. Um, right. So we're balancing, one, we want the same equipment. Two, uh, I've got to pay for this stuff. And they're given that we're a strength gym first and we're you know a machine accessory um that type of gym that's secondary to us so it doesn't make sense for me to pay five thousand dollars per machine for a hammer um and when you're you know when you're taking out leases you know on the business side you've got to lease this stuff and um i've got to pay it back right so right. it's a value proposition for me how much is the is the machines worth to me they're not worth as much as the racks and the bars and the plates and the turf and the deadlift platforms. They have less uh, utility to us at my gyms. Um, so there's that. They cost less and uh, they look good. That's, you know, we talk about environment again. Everything's got to match. Everything in the gym is black mm -hmm. and they sell black equipment. And so it looked good. It worked good. It, it um, It's functional and it hit the right price. So it checked all the boxes that we wanted. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, it was, it was, and, and I'll admit like, and it's the same with everything. There was a, few, I used quite a few different pieces. Um, I do more like bodybuilding style workouts, especially yep. when I go to random gyms. Um, I don't go too heavy. So I use several different pieces of equipment. I always try to use as much equipment as I can when I go to gyms just to get the good feel of it. And then there were some pieces I was like, all right. And there was a couple pieces I'm like, I don't know, but yep. it, it wasn't, it was a bad piece. It was just, you know, wasn't my favorite. 
It's but just different for sure. Yeah, it's just different, you know, and, and maybe if you used it on a regular basis, you're like, okay, I, now I got the feeling. It's the way with certain pieces. I'm like, you know, I've used, I've used lots of hammer strength equipment that I don't like. Yeah. I've used a few pieces of Atlantis and Arsenal equipment that I'm like, no, that was not for me. So, you know, each manufacturer's got different pieces that are, you know, but, and it's, it's interesting. You could tell that this piece was obviously modeled after a Paramount piece that I've used. And this piece was obviously modeled after a hammer strength pieces I've used. So, yep. you know, just because something doesn't say hammer strength doesn't mean it's not modeled after a piece of hammer strength. So, and they definitely steal their design cues. Like they're, they wouldn't even try to hide that. They try to steal design cues from various manufacturers, but um, like I said, for us, the price hit the point, the look hit the, the look was right. And the relative utility to us as a strength first gym, you know, the, the use they get, if you were to sit there and watch all day, the racks get probably five to eight X as much use as the machines. Oh yeah. So, I'm just I'm there, like, yeah, yeah for sure. I did both of your gyms in the same day. Um, and both gyms I was in, I was there in the morning and the racks, most of the racks were full. Um, especially when I went to the second gym because yeah. it was a little bit later in the morning. The first gym wasn't many people there because I was there super early. But the second one, it was a fair amount of people there. And most of the racks were full and a couple of people were using the equipment. And I think that's important for gym owners to know is like, if you're a private gym owner, you can't always buy the best of the best. Like it's, it's just not financially feasible if you're self-funded and you're doing everything um, out of your own pocket or out of your own leases or off your own business. You don't necessarily need to buy the most expensive stuff. You need to buy the stuff that matches your vibe, your community, and your um, who you're trying to serve, and who we serve. Being, you know, like I said, lifters that like to drink after work. Um, they they just they don't need rows of machines, right? They they don't need hammer strength. Everything, and we've had people come in that want hammer strength, and I redirect them to you know some of the other bodybuilding s gyms in the area, and. I think that's what's really important is finding your niche and finding who you right. serve and being like, don't have reservations about it. Mm -hmm. like, this is who we serve. If you need X, Y, Z, you know, this would be a better gym for you. No. And I think that's one of the cool things like about having so many different locally owned gyms out there and available to people. But that's one of the things I was impressed with you from the moment we talked is that you understand who you are and you understand who your clients are. And I think that's, that's a strength. And that's cool. And you don't try to pretend that you're something else. Like you told me right at the beginning, this is not who we are. This is who we are. Yeah, for sure. You know, you set the expectations for me before I even got to the gym that this is what you're going to expect. So don't expect this to be that the other gym down the road. This is who yeah. we are. You know, and and I and it was obvious that that's the expectation you set for your members because that's who they were, and they were all people who came in and they got after it. You know, and you know, it was a big variety of people, but they were all in there getting the work done. So it was cool. Yeah. I think setting expectations, that's a really good way to put it. That's huge for me, for my gym members, for me, for them. But it's not like just because I want to be some gym dictator, right? It's because if you don't set these expectations and these rules and enforce them, um, you're not crafting the best possible experience for everybody. Right. And that's why like, when I think about doing things for the gym, I'm thinking about it for everybody, not just one person. So in this, we deal with this a lot. One person wants one thing, right? Or they want X, Y, Z, or they want insert anything there. Yeah. Um, as the gym owner, you're not worried ever about the one person. And if you are, I think you've taken your mind off the big picture. Yeah. And the big picture is all of your members collectively and your business collectively, not the one person. Yes, 100%. And and I think like adapting to that over time. And if this one person has changed in a way that your gym's no longer suitable, you just got to be okay with that. Right. Um, and don't think you have to pivot the whole thing to serve a small subset of people. Oh yeah. hundred percent. So you, right now you've got two gyms, two gyms. Um, are you, is that where you're going to stop? Like what's the future of archetype? Is there going to be a third gym? Are you looking at making either of the gyms bigger? Like, What's in what's in store for Archetype and its members in the next coming years? Um, so you saw both of our gyms. The bigger one was actually our second gym, and um, the the one you went to later, the square one, um, mm -hmm. that was our third one, which we moved from our first location. 
So the third, the one you went to later is kind of the most recent iteration of archetype. And if I were to do more, it would be just like that. It would be a square room, um, six racks, four to six platforms, machines, turf, and some dumbbells. And, and again, crafting the, the environment. Um, am I going to do more? I'm not sure. I know if I were to do more, I wouldn't do them bigger. I think for most private gyms, um, there's a cost benefit ratio to everything, right? So uh, I think for a private gym, if you get a bigger gym, that one's about 3,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. If I were to get, say, 8,000 square feet, um, my rent goes up, my utilities go up. I have to essentially triple the amount of equipment I have in there. Mm -hmm. And then you need more staff to help upkeep, right? So when you triple the size of a gym, you don't necessarily triple expenses, but you easily double them. Yeah. And I don't see us doubling revenue by doubling the size of the gym, at least for the people we serve. Right. Um, so if I were to do more, I would, they would be just like that one. They'd be about 3000 feet um, in the not strip mall, but what are you industrial areas, yeah. industrial yeah. mall type area. Oh, um, I love, yeah. We love, I love gym, like industrial park, gym yeah park. that's the word there you go yeah. like if you're going to a gym and you like i we always say like if you're going to a gym and you feel like you're getting lost or you start worrying about your safety it's probably <laughs> gonna be a badass gym it's probably gonna be good i would do more there um i don't know if i'm gonna do a third one right now we're um 20 some years in the gym world it makes you want to uh you know, maybe take a break from opening new ones, but at the same time, I'm kind of stuck because we've got a really cool thing too. And I think it's something that could grow and could uh, benefit a lot of other locations. So we're balancing, um, growing the current ones versus maybe opening a third one versus, uh, looking at retail space, uh, commercial space in Raleigh has less than 2%, uh, of availability right now. Oh, wow. So finding a space is just borderline impossible. Yeah. Um, so I'd probably wait for the market to soften up a little bit before we did. And uh, I know my next one, though, I want to put a bar inside of it. That's the goal. Oh, nice. <laughs> is, is abs and like when, when you're around our people long enough, it makes sense that the people, not a big one, um, but get your workout in and then you can sit and have a beer before you go home. I think that's something that would be very interesting to our members. Nice. A bar with a liquor license. Yeah, not even for the uh, the revenue it provides. Like revenue is weirdly one of the things. Like, yeah, it's one of the things I care least about. I just want to do something cool for people and make something cool that serves the people that we like and build on that attractiveness over time to slowly increase the number of members we have. And I think that's something that a lot of our members would take advantage of. Oh, and that that would be unique. Like I've never been. Like I've been to over two hundred gyms, and I've never been to one that you can right. Have afterwards and i love i love experimenting with stuff like that i love it i would love to do it if our next gym um if we did a third one it absolutely will have a small bar area that's open like five to eight or something like that and uh you can do your workout and then get a beer if that happens definitely let me know because i will come down <laughs> i will do that yeah and um and you know as far as that second one goes i think that of the two gyms i went to that one was the one that i enjoyed the best you know both yep. of them had the blacked out walls the cool stuff on the walls and you know the same sort of atmosphere but the second the square and the layout it just really felt more inviting but in a badass way yeah so and i i think that shows the people out there but it's uh 1500 square feet smaller than the bigger one um but it has about 100 more members and it makes more money and it's easier to manage so i don't i don't think gym owners should think that bigger is better always Right. Um, obviously, as you get bigger, you increase your occupancy and your potential for, um, but there's so many other implications with space that you got to take into account. It's not just how many people can I have, how much money can I make, but it's um, what is the experience for the person feel like? What do they like better? What's more inviting? What's more comfortable? And what will be easier to get people into? And you, right. you know, you went to both and the one that's more inviting has more members and makes more money, even though it's yeah. smaller. Right. So I think that's just a really important, it was an, it was a lesson for me, but also just something people should be aware of is um, the size of the gym doesn't determine a whole lot. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I've been to some really big badass gyms, but 
at the same time, like, you know, for someone like myself, that's been to a bunch of gyms, a 30,000 square foot gym, I'm like, hell yeah. Mm -hmm. But that has its own minuses. Like I've talked to a lot of people that are intimidated by 30,000 square foot. Yeah. They walk in, they're like, I don't even know what to do here. Like, I don't even, I, I, you know, I couldn't even imagine going to a gym like that. For sure. Get lost. Right. You know, I, and, and I, and I, I work out in a gym on a daily basis. It's like 6,000 square foot gym. Yep. So, you know, I can, I can appreciate the tightness and the family of that. Yeah. And that, I think that's another part that gets lost in the size of a gym is the bigger it is, like the more people don't meet each other in a mm -hmm. real way. Yeah. The people in a 20 square foot gym are just by the nature of proximity going to know each other less than the people at my gym. It's just how it works. Um, at, at my gym, if you're on different corners from each other, you're still 100 feet apart max, right? Right. So yeah. um, I, I think that's another thing, especially for first time gym owners, like smaller is usually going to be better. Yeah. And I feel like we, we kind of covered this already, but I thought yeah. we should ask it anyway. Yeah. Um, every time we have a new gym owner on we always ask them like now that you've had a gym for a few years and you've been through the trials and tribulations that you have been and everybody yep. goes through those um is there some advice or a piece of advice that you would give to someone that is thinking about owning a gym or opening a gym so my background was strength conditioning right i worked with collegiate athletes i worked with um nfl and combine athletes coming out of grad school so all I ever did was athletics, but I had known so many gym owners that opened sports performance gyms. Um, and every single one of them without fail turned to fitness at some point to pad their revenue. So the first thing I would tell just coaches in general is sports. If you're interested in sports training, it's not going to pay the bills um, or it's not going to pay the bills year round. So fitness is important. That's why I went from strength conditioning to general fitness slash you know, power lifter, or lifter for fun type thing. Um, embrace, embrace fitness, general population. Um, don't get too complex with your service offerings. I've done that. I've had like, you can do nine different service offerings, pick which one to try. And that goes back to trying to serve everybody optimally. You can't do that. Um, so what we do now, we just have three different things and we just, we really try to do those three things well, and that's it. But open gym is our bread and butter. That's where I put 90% of my attention. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've outsourced our personal training so that I don't have to worry about that. Um, our We do small group classes, but we don't do many of them. That was our emphasis for a long time. Um, and I can go into further on small group stuff if you want to know some implications of that. It's a very different world than open gym. Oh, completely. I've and seen it. It is... It, open gym, just the nature of the client that does open gym. Um, you have two things. You have CrossFit and you have everybody else, right? CrossFit people, are they're going to be committed. They're going to do it forever. They love CrossFit. They love the community, the brand, the culture, the workouts, everything. But if you're not a CrossFit and you're trying to do small group, you're going to have a lot more issues than your typical CrossFit will. And uh, I think going into the mindset, and I didn't know this because my gym was only classes when I first opened. And you get a lot of uh, turnover. You get a, people that are like not really used to training. They might look at your gym, but then they'll quit shortly after. It's just really hard to build a business off small group classes. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of advertising stuff you do, challenges, free trials, well, you know, endless offers. Right. Um, at the end of the day, it's a it's a churn and burn model where you're just trying to trying to grow. Um, but open gym was the thing I found that worked best for us because it combined everything I loved. I love lifting. I love helping lifters. I, I don't love having to convince people to work out. I actually, actually really hate doing that. Oh yeah. Completely. And so we found open gym worked best for me and my gyms. And so we started uh, offering that during the COVID era and it took off. So um, we switched almost exclusively to open gym. So I think it, I think it depends on who you are. One of my really good friends, he's a super personable guy. He loves coaching, loves talking to people. He has a sports performance gym that does some personal training on the side because that's who he is. That's what he right. loves. I don't love that. I coached for far too long and I don't ever want to coach again. So open gym works great for me because it allows me to be in the gym space without having to act actively coach every day. Right. 
No, that um, makes sense. Yeah, know who you are, what you can offer, who you serve, and um, think every single day how you can improve that just by 1%. That's awesome. Yeah, no. Yeah, and thank you for coming on. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I loved the gems. I thought they were cool, and they were definitely what you said they would be, like no-nonsense, mm -hmm. hard-working kind of places. So that was cool. Thank you for again for coming on and appreciate it. Let me know if you get that, get that new or next third one open. Oh, it'd be awesome, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel for more great content.